Well, we're, we're really happy that Mike and Pam Ryan came up from Santa Fe today. They have just officially become Westerners, having sold their house east of the Mississippi. So, um, and moved permanently to Santa Fe, am I right? Well, Jackson, your, your definition of recent, it's been five years, so <laughs> I know still, that was... You still had the house there because you didn't want to let go, that right? Was, I don't know who he's talking to here. I'm, I'm, I'm in the wings here. Yeah, recently. <laughs> so they're done. They can't go back. Uh, and that's great. But Mike has been a, a real aficionado of turquoise and has studied this and talked to over 70 dealers and miners and jewelers and everything else. And he wrote, he wrote the first book with Philip Shambliss, which was really a good early history of of the uh, turquoise mining and the characters and the places where these things were mined and how all this stuff happened. And the, the second book is, is much more, um, I, I think the, the, the stories of the characters and the people in this business now are a little bit more, they're a little crazier today. I don't know if they're tougher, but they're a little crazier. Well, I had two murders in the last book, so. <laughs> <laughs> They, you know, That's pretty crazy. They, a lot of mining takes place up by uh, Tonopah in Nevada. And I heard it, there's, they have a great old hotel there. Do you remember the name of that hotel? Uh, the um, Mizpah. The Mizpah Hotel. Mizpah. And there was um, the guy that recently refurbished the thing. It's like the straighter now. And in the, he has a big history of the, how, what he did to refurbish it and fix it up. And in the very last sentence says there was absolutely no economic justification for the amount of money that went into this hotel, but Tonopah deserves a grand hotel. And it was in that hotel that Jack Dempsey um, had one of his uh, fights, and he won the fight and got his prize money, and he and the guy that he fought were in the bar drinking afterwards, and a guy came in, pulled a gun on him, and robbed him, and they were all broke after that, so <laughs> it's an interesting town. But anyway, Mike is going to tell some great stories. I want to just mention, next sat, next uh, Friday night is the Gallery Walk in Durango, and we're going to do a really cool thing. We had a, a wonderful um, uh, master's degree candidate who spent her summer here working with Paulita, back in the back is Paulita, who is uh, actually from Second Mesa. And uh, she actually took, uh, took Marion to a, a dance down there and spent a lot of time. She worked with carvers and did a lot of research. And we had this collection of old dolls that we wanted to do something special with. So for, we're gonna have a gallery opening on, on Friday night during the gallery walk featuring all these old dolls and all of the descriptive work that Marion worked out over the summer. So it's going to be a lot of fun. But I was going to introduce you to Leah back here and uh, Ashley, who's our audio video photographer person. And my mom, Mary Jane, is here. So, so um, I think it's, it's uh, going to be a fun night. I hope you all enjoy it. And Mike will answer questions afterwards, and afterwards, if you're interested in books, he'll tell you about those, and we can we can certainly handle that as well. I think you'll like them. All right. Okay. All your Thank you. Right. Thank you. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming out. Paulita, am I on my mark? Is it good? I'm on my mark here? Okay. <laughs> Usually, you're supposed to have a little X right here, but anyway. So, it's really great to be here in Durango, and I want to thank Jackson. And especially the grand lady of Durango, Mary Jane, who you all recognized before. So thanks very much for uh, inviting Pam and I out here. Pamela, Ryan, my, I would say long suffering, but you know when, when a wife of 48 years will put up with my turquoise mistress, yeah. she's yeah. pretty good. Pretty good. <laughs> so this is in many respects sort of a turquoise homecoming for me because um, I think we're getting a little bit of ringing here. A little feedback on that. Maybe I'll just speak a little softer. It's better now, I think. A turquoise homecoming for me because in 1975, my very young, barely legal wife, I must say at that time, 
we're coming out here through in the West. Now, who was here in Durango in 1975 besides Mary Jane? And there's a few here. It's a little different, wasn't it? Yeah. So I was going along, we were going along Main Street, and there were turquoise shop or you know, jewelry shop, so I went in there and I bought my first cabochon of turquoise. And it was a Bisbee. And then years later I find out that in many respects, Durango is sort of ground central for Bisbee turquoise. And we can get into that story a little bit, if you've never heard it. It's a good story. So if you're real nice, you might drag it out of me. I don't know. We'll see. But, you know, when you're thinking of what you want to talk about at a talk like this, you know, the first thing you think of, oh, we'll just talk turquoise and start going through the different mines and stuff like that. But that would be a really terrible idea, because then you'd all leave and you'd go, I didn't need to read the book. The guy just told me everything. So, <laughs> I'm not going to do that, but what I thought might be interesting for you is to hear from an author what goes in to making a book. Now, I'm not a professional author. I had a 30-year career as a financial advisor, and when I retired in 2011, we had reason to come out west because we had some children out here, and uh, I got bit by the turquoise bug. And I just got into it. I started collecting turquoise. I learned how to cut turquoise. And I just kept asking questions and bugging all these people. And they said, well, we don't know all that history stuff. Go talk to Chambless. He knows all that stuff. So I went and Philip and I had breakfast and some little nondescript dive on Central Avenue where they have, you know, probably the best Nuevo Mexicano food in the world, and over Huevos Rancheros, we decided to do a book. And Philip had, um, Philip's a prospector, turquoise prospector. And before that, I'll tell you get an idea about Philip. I'll tell you one story, and that'll, you'll know Philip through and through. He graduates from some little college in Alabama, Southern boy. And he's heard all these stories about the West. So he's got to go out West. So he comes out West. He starts working for the Desert Museum in Tucson. And the recession hits in 74. He gets laid off. So he heads out to the mountains outside of El Moro, which is, which is uh, near uh, Zuni. It's in there in those Zuni mountains, near the ice caves. And he gets, you know, 40, 20 acres or 40 acres or whatever, you know, it probably cost him $300 or something then. And, um, and he'd gotten a bonus when he got laid off, so he had a few dollars. So he goes out there and he's got a saw and whatnot, so he cuts down some trees and he builds a log cabin. Philip is still in the log cabin. He's had three wives. <laughs> and I don't know if there's any connection. He's had three heart attacks, too. <laughs> But he's still in the log cabin. So I think you guys got a picture of Philip. Philip had been researching for 20 years about the mines. Now, he didn't start out saying, oh, I'm going to research the history of the old turquoise ones. He wanted to find turquoise. He had that prospector's bit. So the way it works in this country, if you want turquoise on public land, you go out, you find where you think it is, you stake it, you file a claim, and you've got the mineral rights. It's all governed under the 1872 Mining Act. Now, can you imagine any other law in America that we're still working under from 1872? And it applies whether you're Kennecott Mining that has the deepest open pit gold mine, which is in Eureka County in Nevada, or you're out there digging a, you know, a, a, a septic tank size hole in the ground that has no environmental impact, you're all under the same law. But he wanted to find out where is that turquoise in them there hills, not gold. He wanted turquoise. So he was poking around in the registrar's offices and areas, and finding out where he could go and make claims, file claims. Well, in so doing, he came across this all this fantastic history 
that nobody knew about. And that is all in Turquoise in America, part one. And you can see here from this lady on the front, this isn't the turquoise that you're going to see at Tolatin. This was turquoise that they were making for the East Coast. It was Victorian jewelry. And they didn't want any uh, matrix. In fact, they didn't even know about Indian jewelry because in the 1890s, there was Indian jewelry being made, but it wasn't coming off the reservation. The Navajo had it for themselves and the Zuni. And it wasn't until later when the tourist market developed that we began to have what we consider now the turquoise market. But this was the type of turquoise, and they only wanted the sky blue, right? And this is a, this is a Victorian style, and they would take this. Now, this is very big pieces of, of turquoise. You know, they took a Van Cleef and Arpels, very famous European uh, jewelry. They took the Empress Josephine's tiara. Remember Napoleon got crowned emperor and his Josephine was his empress? And she had this tiara with diamonds. Well, later on, Van Cleef and Arpels took the diamonds out and they put turquoise in it. And right now, I don't know who has that. But these are the big pieces. Usually, they were real small, low pieces of turquoise and they were set in cluster settings with pearls, diamonds, and other precious gems. And so that's the story that is told here in Turquoise in America Part 1, Great American Turquoise Fashion. When we get to Turquoise in America Part 2, um, 1910 to 1990, then we start to find the introduction of Indian Ameri yeah, Native American jewelry into the market. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that as I explain what into, went into uh, devising the concept behind writing a book. So we worked on that first book, and it came out in uh, 2016. And this was the original publication. And as you can see, once I did this book, this one was, you know, no, not going to work. We've got to have this one. So Jackson was asking me today, he said, what's the difference between them? Well, this one's a lot prettier. <laughs> <laughs> Philip looked at that. He's, he's got a crush on, on a, a poster lady. This was, this was from a, uh, a, a, a brochure for the Toltec Gem Mining Company. And here Philip is, 1906. And here Philip is, and I can tell he's got a crush on, on, this, on this lady. So I was kidding, we were doing this, this program in, in Albuquerque. And I said, yeah, that was, when Philip was young, this was his girlfriend. So. <laughs> <laughs> but this was the one, this was published uh, on, you know, on demand printing through Amazon. And you know, on this one, I decided, you know, I got nothing against Jeff Bezos, but. I don't need to get him higher into outer space. Yeah. He's gone far enough. He doesn't need Mike to help him with that. So fortunately, I was able to have the means to get these books printed. And uh, publishing is not a place if I had financial services business, and it was, it was pretty, pretty, good, pretty good for me. Um, but being an author is you're way down on the pecking list. But I do console myself. I say, well, it could be worse. I could be a musician. <laughs> and they're at the, really at the bottom. So anyway, after we did the first book, I wanted to do the second book. Now, the first book, when you're writing a book, it's just like doing anything creative. You have to have a vision. You have to conceive it. Are any jewelers here? Anybody? Any jeweler there? Oftentimes, and I don't know how you work, but oftentimes jewelers will have to sketch out. Oh yes, you see, he's saying all that. You don't just start whamming away at the silver and all that stuff, you're gonna end up losing a lot of money on that. You have to know in your mind and conceive it. And there's always an arc. There's a, to a piece of jewelry or anything creative, there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. And hopefully, when you get to the end, it's 
kind of where you thought you were going to be, it'll always be a little different. And that's the magic of the process. This first book, we already had a central theme, which was the East Coast jewelers who had come to the West sourcing turquoise for this Victorian jewelry. And their goal, you know, think about that, this is back in the 1890s, and the whole goal in business then was to vertically integrate and control every process because we had, in the oil business, you had a monopoly. You know, Rockefeller, one of the richest guys ever, because he controlled most of the oil in the world at one time. And in banking, you had uh, J.P. Morgan. In steel, you had Carnegie. So you had all these guys, and they said, I want it all. We're going to control every little process. So they thought they'd do the same thing with turquoise. We'll come in, we'll get control of, of the, the raw product, of the mining of it. We'll have a cartel, we'll control the price, and then we'll vertically integrate up to the retail product. And they couldn't do it. It all, it all fell apart. But we tell that story how they tried in part one. So that was the theme. And uh, Philip had already structured, we had a title, The Great American Turquoise Rush. He'd written about 15% of, of the text. So I had a lot that I could build upon to make that. With the second book, all I knew is the book wanted to be written. The book was telling me, you gotta write, me. you gotta write, you gotta write this book. So I had to come up with a, with a concept. And the concept, and I learned this in financial services, follow the money. If you follow the money, you're usually going to get an answer. It's probably pretty close to the story. And in this instance, the money was the shift in capital and investment from East Coast to the West Coast. One thing I'll point out that comes out on that book you go around almost any place in America, you're going to find a Tiffany mine, especially a turquoise mine. Because when you look at this, this beautiful blue, Tiffany was the Tiffany blue. In 1857, they came out with their first blue book. I think it was 1857. It started it in 1837. And it started as a dry goods company. He was selling stationery and pens. Do you know what that was in 1837? That was the internet. That was TikTok. That was Instagram. You wanted to communicate, you wrote. And they had mail two or three deliveries a day because that was the way everybody communicated. That's how you did business. So Tiffany then, in the late 1850s, he bought a jewelry company, got involved in that. And being a shrewd businessman, he's looking around and he's saying, who's got the money? Well, the, who had the money were the Carnegies, the Rockefellers, all of this. They had more money than they knew what to do with. There's a problem. They had no prestige. They had more money than the aristocracy in the old country. But they were just bumpkins. So they were like, okay, we'll show them. First thing they did is, we're going to send our daughters there and their dowry is going to buy them to be a princess or a duchess or what, whatever. And you know, Winston Churchill's mother was an American. And she, was, she married the Duke of, of uh, Marlborough. So that was the era then. So Tiffany says, well, we'll sell them all the silver plate and all this. So that's how Tiffany really got started. But the blue book came before the turquoise, as did the blue box. And he understood about branding. And they said, the only place you can get that blue box is when you buy something from Tiffany and Company. Native American jewelry coming to market. Well, there, there was no market, right? When was Durango founded? 1880. Very good. And why was it founded? The railroad came here, sure. Durango Silverton Railroad, and I think it was 81 then they got up to Silverton. Why did they have to get to Silverton? <laughs> to shift the ore down to Durango and then ship it off to Denver. 
and then take it on to, to a uh, market. So it was all the railroads. So I said, aha, we're going to follow the railroads. And when it comes to Native American jewelry, there was one primary railroad involved, and it was the Santa Fe. Santa Fe. At that time, the Etchison, Topeka, and the Santa Fe. It got to Las Vegas, New Mexico. No, excuse me. It got, yeah, 1880. It was 1880, 1881. They finally got to Laney. They got the spur up to Santa Fe. Um, and they didn't, they wanted to run up through Santa Fe, but if you know Santa Fe's up on the plateau, and you got to go down into the Rio Grande Valley, and that's expensive because railroad grades, I think you've got maybe three degrees or something that you can work with. So going down and coming back up was going to be really expensive. And they looked out south, and here's this Galisteo Plateau, and they're going, that's a lot cheaper to go that way. So they went down that way through that. So the railroads came through. And the railroads, primarily, if you think about it, what's the first thing that a railroad has to carry as they're building the railroad? Well, yeah, exactly. They got to have the steel, the lumber, because they're out there saying, we got to do lay the next track, lay the next track. And it was all the freight going out there. So these railroads, and they're rushing and rushing because it's after the Civil War, and they're all fighting when they can be the first ones to get to California. And uh, so they're all rushing to do that. It's freight traffic. And then the railroad said, well, we need more profit center here. We need to have passengers. We need real passengers. You know, passengers don't like to get treated like freight. And it was terrible there. You go there and they feed you some stuff and then put it back in the pot for the next people that would come through. <laughs> no place to say, well, there's this sharp Englishman named Fred Harvey who came in. He looked at this situation. And he said, we need to change that. But he changed it in a big way. And, and Fred Harvey was really the first name. I can see there's a lot here who are going to know. You had Fred Harvey, and after uh, Fred Harvey, you know, you had uh, Howard Johnson. You know, you had these, uh, these names, especially from the, went from the railroads, then it went to the interstate. And you had all these names, and they were branding the hospitality. And Fred Harvey was the first brand in the United States, predates Coca-Cola. And it was a big brand. Because he took going from where you're getting served the slop from the last person who ate, he had it now. You come in, linen table. You're in Topeka, Kansas, my gosh, and you're going out. And they got a linen tablecloth. And you're on this Irish china or, or you know, linens and this Sheffield silver dining set. You know, it's just blowing people's minds. Then, he didn't like the rough and tumble stuff going on here where you had these cowboys who were serving it up and the cowboys coming in and we're going to get tough and we'll do this and do that. And no, sir, you shall not. You shall not do that in my establishment. We shall be genteel here. And we shall do that by bringing this young Kansas maidens to serve you. And you had the creation of the Harvey girls. And at Posada, the Posada Hotel, they still have a group of women there who dress up in the, in the uniforms and they do the tours, and it's really a lot of fun. So, the, revolutionize the hospitality business. Well, when you're feeding people, what's next? You know, it's a long drive out there, and you're creating a tourist industry, right? So it's like, well, I don't want to just pass all this up. I want to go and look around. I need a place to stay tonight. Mm. Well, we have just the thing for you. Okay. <coughs> and he was such a shrewd businessman. He cut the steel with Santa Fe, where his only overhead was the food and the staff. Everything else was paid for by the railroad. Everything was cash. The Harvey Company never worked in debt. All cash. So this guy, they had just, they were doing very, very well. And then they went, he went to the railroad, and he said, you really need to have you know, hotels. And they, and, and they said, we'll make you a great deal. You build them, we'll run them, and we'll take all the profit. 
And the railroad goes, that's a great idea. Why didn't we think of that? So in um, 1901, Fred dies. Fred had been ill his whole life. He, when he had first come, came to New York, and he had two pounds in his pocket. Like two pounds at that time was actually a pretty good amount for an immigrant to have that. Got him started. He learned the, the, the restaurant business in New York, because Delmonico's had started there, and they were one of the first restaurants in America. You probably heard that name. Because before that, all you had were you know, taverns, basically. You didn't have restaurants, as, as we know. So he went down to New Orleans, and he learned more of the hospitality business, but he got yellow fever. And he, was, he had the implications of that all through his life. So he passed away in 1901. His son, Ford, took over. 1901 was a very important year because in that year, Ford took a trip to the Grand Canyon. And um, uh, Charles Loomis, I think his name was. You've got to read the book to get all this. I, I can't remember all of it here. I'm, I'm giving away more than I've said I've already here. But. And Charles Loomis had walked across the United States and he'd written it all up, and he was writing all these promotional things for California, primarily. Well, his roommate at Harvard was Teddy Roosevelt. So when they went to the Grand Canyon, and he had the, the Santa Fe people, and, the, and uh, here he was representing the, the Fred Harvey organization. And of course, the railroad people, all the business people are saying, hey, hey, baby, baby, let's put it right up in the corner, right here. Now look, I want you to be able to look down and see the bottom of the canyon. We're putting this right on the edge here. Come on, come on, it's money, it's money. And Loomis is like, whoa, they're going to destroy this place. And uh, he had his ace in the hole, Teddy. But hey, we shall not destroy this beautiful nature. I don't know if that's the way Teddy sounded, but <laughs> kind of works a little bit. So there I had my theme. And then once, in 1901 too, you also had the development of the Fred, Hind uh, Fred Hardy Indian Department. Because now they had a whole tourist market. They could feed this growing tourist industry. They could house them. But you've got to sell them stuff. Well, one of the things they sold them was in the newsstands, they developed a whole group of brochures about the great southwest across the Kansas prairie. Hey, it's beautiful, right? For about 10 minutes. And then the next 10 minutes is, yeah, it's still beautiful, it's still great, but you know that drive across Kansas. It's, it's fun. So they would have this reading material and stuff that they'd sell them about what you're gonna see when you're not just looking at more miles of prairie. And so they'd come into the the uh, Alvarado at, in Albuquerque. And they had the Indian room. And they had El of Ganado, this weaver. And here she is weaving these, you know, like it was the first diorama. It was Disneyland. That's a whole other story. When Disney was first creating Disneyland, you know who he, who he went to? Fred Harvey. Because he knew about branding. And he knew what Harvey had done in creating this whole way of marketing. So you walk in, you've been reading this information about all the things you're going to look for. You walk into the Indian room. Here's El of Ganado weaving. And here's her husband, Tom, who by all accounts was quite the character and could work the crowd. These people were hooked. But one thing they weren't buying in 1901, 1904, 1901 or two was when the Alvarado finished. One thing they weren't buying during that first decade was the jewelry. Because the jewelry market really did not come up to its own until the 1920s or so. And that was that period where Fred Harvey jewelry came into being. Because there's one thing I'm sure Jackson will say, as many people come in here every day, and of course directing them to the finest you know, the, the, the case with the finest jewelry. Oh, that's so beautiful. That's wonderful. Do you have anything less expensive? <laughs> well, yes, we do. 
And that's what happened with this Native American jewelry, because most of it, the early period, was very heavy jewelry. And it really didn't fit so well with budgets and with um, a more delicate wrist, shall we say. And so you had the development of the slider jewelry. Unfortunately, a lot of that was machine made to keep the cost down. And that's been a challenge ever since. But it was that development that really led to creating the market for turquoise. And, and the story we tell in here is all about how the different mines were developed in Nevada, primarily, and then in Colorado. Before that, in part one, it had been New Mexico and Arizona. After the turquoise began to be sourced from Nevada and Colorado, production in New Mexico and Arizona just went to nothing. Because the large companies were all in there mining in Arizona copper. And they were all mining copper by a deep pit. Because they'd find, they'd go, well, you do this, you, you run your test, you find out, here's the, here's the high grade ore, and you go right to it and you extract the high-grade ore. Here's the high-grade ore, we'll go over here, we'll extract it in all these tunnels. Well, after a while, they'd taken out all the high-grade ore. It was too expensive for them to keep doing that tunneling to go to the lower grade. They knew they had to do open pit mining, but there was a problem. The technology they'd had at that time is they had these little trucks that couldn't carry any overburden, and you had to remove, literally, mountains to get to that ore. After World War II, advances in metallurgy had advanced because we had to create jet airplanes and everything else going on there. They could now build these trucks that could carry 20, 30 times the amount of overburden that they could before. And so that's why in 1950, at the Lavender Pit at Bisbee, they started open pit mining and they found Bisbee Turquoise. Um, Bob Matthews was an electrical contractor. He was an electrical contractor, developer. Mary Jane can tell all about him, I'm sure. Remembers uh, Bob and his wife, Mar. So Bob was working here. <coughs> Mar Mickelson had been married to Horace King. Have any of you heard of King Manasseh Turquoise? Yeah. I'm from Manassa. You're from Manassa. Yeah. Okay, well then you probably know the King family, the Mickelson family. Yeah. You're from Manassa. There's not that big a place. Yeah, it's not. not. not <laughs> everybody knows everybody. And, and you know what? They're all related. You're probably related somehow. I am. Yeah, yes. exactly. <laughs> and then you're all related here in Nevada because they went, that's the connection. That was one of the real uh, joys in part two. <coughs> Because everybody knew about the Edgars, the Kings, and this, but it was in a real kind of generic way. Nobody had really taken the time to plot it out. And, you know, with the Mormon families, they're big. And so we had lots of them. So I did that, and fortunately with genealogy.ancestor.com and all this, you can do this a lot easier than it was in the past. So I really tracked out all the Kings and all the Edgars and the Smiths and, and the Mickels. Is that the Smiths? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so then you're related to the Kings because Bill's, yeah. Bill's mother was a Smith. Yes. And her sister was married to Lynn Otteson. Gets the connection yes. with the Otteson. They're, so on both sides, they're my cousins. Yeah. 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 Well, they're everybody's cousins. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you go into battle. I go into Battle Mountain with Rex Edgar. And he's going, everybody I see, they say, we're related. And I've never seen him before in my life. <laughs> well, we tell all that story in there. And that was very rewarding because uh, uh, Jackson was talking about the 70 people I interviewed. And I really didn't realize it was that many because I started doing the interviews before I was even thinking about a book. So I'm doing these interviews. And um, I get the interview. I get it transcribed. And then I'd send it to the person. And every one of those people, they'd read that, they all had the same reaction. Oh my God, I sound like an idiot. <laughs> and I'm going, I'm not going to tell them what, it, what they sounded like before I cleaned it up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
So then the next thing I had to do is I had to get Mike out of there because if, I thought, if you think you sounded like an idiot, you should think what Mike thought hearing himself in that interview process. So I had to get myself out of there and then put it together into a story form. And that's what Jackson was referring to of the stories of turquoise. And we, you will love it because you're going to say, oh, I'm related to them. <laughs> and your name is? Cindy. Smith. C Cindy Smith. So you're is that in, is it Sanford? Uh, or Man no, you're in Manassas. Yeah, I grew up in Manassas. But the Smiths, I know Mark and, and Cindy and, and that part of the family, they're up, what's the next town up? Sanford. Sanford, Sanford yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So anyway, you'll, you'll like it. You'll like that. Okay. Good. Um, so anyway, so that was the that was the the arc story arc, and from that, then I could start to put together the book because I now had my what I call point of view. <clears throat> I didn't want it to be about just the turquoise. Turquoise doesn't tell much of a story. It can be very beautiful. It's really beautiful to look at, but in and of itself, there there is no story to that. Does it really matter whether it was extracted in 1920 or 1990 or, you know, I mean, it's, it's beautiful, it's beautiful. But what did matter were the people. And people like to hear about other people, like to hear their stories. So the one thing everybody tells me, they really do enjoy the stories of turquoise. I know you can tell I, I really have a difficult time. <coughs> opening up about this subject. <laughs> so I'll tell you what. Um, I want to hear what you guys want to know about turquoise. So I'm going to open this up now to some questions, some comments, some observations. And if any of you have any turquoise that you'd like to have identified, we have with us this evening the world's foremost expert in turquoise identification, Jackson Clark. <laughs> <laughs> I heard him earlier, and he's always walking by, and they go, yeah, we have the, the world's foremost authority on turquoise, and I said, oh boy, <laughs> somebody's going to come up and go, what's this? <laughs> Mike, who is the most interesting minor person you ran into in all of these interviews? Well, I have to say that is Cousin Bill King, huh? because um, with the first book, um, John Cheney, who's a longtime uh, Indian jewelry dealer out of Albuquerque, he said, Mike, I like the first book, but man, you've got to tell more stories. You know, it's really kind of dry. I do warn you, there are parts in part one that can read a little bit like the first four chapters in the Bible. <laughs> Shadrach begat Obitrashak and, you know, the stuff going on and on. But I wanted to do that because we needed to document that history or else it would have been lost. So there is when this mine was located and this one and that one. So there are some parts, but stick with it because there's two murders coming up. <laughs> it's a little bit, a little bit juicier as you go on there. But Bill King, because I, I couldn't, I didn't have anybody from that period. I said, I agree with you, John, but there was nobody to interview. They're all dead. In fact, not only were they dead, nobody even knew about them. Nobody even knew about this period. It would have been lost if not for this book. But part two, I could go to Bill King. Bill's 87. And he could tell me stories that he heard from Pete, his dad, mm -hmm. and, that, and that he had heard from um, Charles, his grandfather, and that Charles had heard from his dad, I.P. And I'll tell you one brief one. It's a really good one. We think it might be, a, we might be a murder. I'm not going to say murder. I believe it was, it was involuntary manslaughter. <laughs> Do I have your attention? <laughs> okay. So the family came out in 1909, I.P. Smith evaporated. He was just gone. They didn't know what happened. He was gone. And everybody said, well, he, he abandoned the family. He did this, he did that, the other. Well, Bill King tells a story of 
Soward was the man's name. And when Bill first moved back to Manassas in the 70s from Las Lunas, this guy was an old man at that time. And he remembered as a boy seeing IP Israel Purvoy's king come out of his house, just matter as a hornet. And he, he'd gotten into a fight with his son Charles. And as the story goes, IP would maybe get into his cups or something, and he would be rough with his, with his wife. And Charles was standing up for Mama and knocked his dad down. He gets up, no son of mine is going to knock me down, so he goes off in a huff. Well, they all said he headed towards Albuquerque, or for Santa Fe. But that's not the way he went. He went east. He didn't go south. He went towards the mine. And at that time, at the mine, his son-in-law, and I can't remember his name right now, but you know what I can do? I can find it in the book. <laughs> his son-in-law was out there, and what, what Bill speculated was he went out there and they got into a row, and accidentally, you know, you're up there and you, you hit, you fall down, you hit your head or whatever. So when, when, and Bill said this because when he opened up the pit for open pit mining in the 70s, he found an area where there was a shaft. Because when you're doing drilling, first rule, if it were my rule, if I were digging the holes in the ground like that, is I want to make darn sure that thing's not going to fall in on me, right? The other thing is, is you're digging farther and farther and farther into the ground, you start to lose your breath a little bit. Gosh, I'm not getting any air in here. Well, I wonder why you're 50 feet underground. You've got to have pumps, you've got to have that, so they'd have to get air holes, right? So they go down and they get down, they couldn't breathe, so they dig a shaft in so that they could get some air done in there. So he came in on one of those shafts, but it had been filled in. But it was filled in with material that was not from right around. You know, you dig a shaft, if you do want to fill it in, what do you think you're going to do? Yeah, I'm going to go over here a half mile and bring back a few tons of rock to fill in this hole in the ground. You're going to go right whatever's right there. Well, the rock that was in there didn't come from that area came from somewhere else. So he said somebody wanted to make darn sure that that was all filled in. So it's just speculation, but Bill believes that IP is at the bottom of that shaft. And that is why he never extended the open pit mine into that area. So that'll give you an idea of why I like Bill King's stories. Because he tied it back into this much earlier period. So I had Jackson had a, I was a setup. I told him <laughs> he's in on all that. Which mine produced the most turquoise? Well, uh, that's that's easy, and it's still in operation right now. And that's the Kingman mine, which is on Turquoise Mountain outside of Kingman in the old Mineral Park area. But that has been primarily in recent years because they're still producing there. Um, and, and that's primarily because the, the amount of volume of material they get, so much of that is what we call chalk. Turquoise in itself is a very soft stone, and 80% or more requires some form of treatment in order to be used in jewelry. And primarily that is done by what we call stabilization process, where you inject some form of plastic. And this really didn't develop, again, until after the war, where you had the development of both, um, uh, what are the two types? Of, what's the, what's the hypoxy, hypoxy? And then what's the other one that's the thinner um, treatment you use? I'm drawing a blank on it. It's in the po polymers. Po yeah, they're all polymers. They're different polymers. Anyway. You have to inject that, and, and some of it is, is, is depends on the turquoise and which plastic is better and which you do with that. There's another process that has been called enhanced, 
And that's where you actually grow silicon crystals inside the turquoise. And the real reason for that is turquoise is a hydrous aluminum phosphate. And hydrous means water. There's water in it. Well, you take it out of the ground, water dries out. So the, the water molecules that are all connected into that, when they dry out, that leaves gaps in there. It changes the refraction of the light. So when you take turquoise out of the ground, you go, wow, that's really beautiful. You let it dry out, and it goes, this is all white. It looks terrible. So then you fill in those gaps, and you get this color back. Here's a good example that was told to me by Marty Cobalt, who is the miner at uh, Kingman. He says, you take concrete. You pour the concrete. What's the color? It's dark gray, right? And it dries out. What's the color? It's a light. It's a light gray. You spray it with water. What's the color? It's dark gray. It's the same thing with turquoise. That's why you go to a turquoise shop, beware when they pull out the spray bottle <laughs> on the rough turquoise. Yeah, look at my turquoise. Wow, that's really pretty. Well, that's the way it's going to look when you finish. Well, maybe. So that's just the, the way the light, because of light, you, the colors we see are refracted. In other words, it's the light bouncing off of that in our eyes, and then we translate that into color. So 80% or more has to be treated, and that's why you have a two-tier market, and why natural turquoise is so much more expensive. In fact, I don't know, Jackson, if here, for your natural turquoise jewelry, doesn't that account for most of the the price difference? It does. Yeah. It does. I mean, turquoise is going from 30 cents a carat to $80 a carat. Yeah. And, and it's a bargain at $80. Because what he doesn't tell you then is that in 1905, the average price for a high grade U.S. turquoise was $15 a carat. You know what that is in today's dollars? 300. So back then when you say, you know, cowboy made $30 a month, that's about $600, $600 or so in current dollars. So that's how much uh, prices have appreciated. So I tell people, yeah, even at, at $80, where else can you get anything that is a third of the price of what it was 100 and some years ago? Turquoise is a tremendous bargain. The reason we don't see it that way is because of the stabilized market, which can put so much product on the marketplace and at, at just a fraction of the cost. So it really requires a discriminating purchaser who really gets bit by the buck and who really says, you know, for me, having that natural turquoise, feeling that what we call zat. There's an energy that comes from turquoise. And it's something that native peoples have known for a long time. And it's why the pharaohs in Egypt, any of you remember the, when, when the tombs of King Tutankhamun came through in the 1870s, the exhibition at the museums, King Tut? And that's when they found these sarcophagus and they were all covered with turquoise. Well, that was to continue for the pharaoh to have with these these powers of healing uh, into the afterlife. In Persia, the Shah of, of Iran controlled the turquoise market. And he would take these cabochons, like these, these blue cabochons like this. He would put these on the helmet and on the weapons of his warriors. Because in Farsi, the word for turquoise is faruja, and it has the same root as the word for victory. So he would want to have his warriors go into victory. And the Shah would never sell turquoise to his enemies. He didn't want them to have that power. So there are people who have felt this special aspect of natural turquoise. And you know, you take a, you take a stone, you fill it up with plastic, not the same. It's just not. It's cheaper, and if that's your whole standard, you know, 
You go out and buy butter, yeah, buy it on price, no problem. Hey folks, this ain't butter. <laughs> yes, ma'am? What percentage of the turquoise mined in the world comes from the U.S. versus outside the U.S.? Oh. I can't, I can't answer you in an informed way, so I'll answer you in, yeah. in my own off the cuff and take it for, for what it's worth. There's very little turquoise being produced in the United States. Um, there's very little coming from Egypt. Egypt's an interesting situation. The, the people who control the turquoise mines now are the same people who controlled the turquoise mines when King Tutankhamun was getting the turquoise there. It's Bedouin tribesmen. And um, I had heard that it was very difficult for the turquoise trade because of the ISIS activity in the Sinai. So I contacted a, a turquoise dealer from Egypt, and he said, yeah, there's, they're there. He says, but they're in the north. And I said, well, that makes sense. They want to be close to Israel, right? I mean, they don't. Because he says, in the south, you have to deal with the bad one. He says, nobody wants to mess with the bad one. He says, if you go there, he says, you can go with me. And you'll be fine. But you go strolling in there, and it's just not a good idea. It's just not a good idea. And the Egyptian government doesn't care because there are other minerals there that, that they extract. And what do they care about turquoise, right? I mean, there's no, if, if there was great money in turquoise, you wouldn't have the copper companies here bearing it and doing everything they can to not have people extract turquoise. There's no money in it. Um, you know, when, when the... <laughs> Uh, maybe, have you heard of number eight turquoise? Number eight is a very famous turquoise. Uh, it came out of a mine in Eureka County, and, and uh, um, the Edgar, it was, it was Cutler, I, well, Cutler and Dick, I forget which one, I don't know how well you know the Edgars. But uh, they sold their claims, I think it was for ten or $20,000, 1964, and they sold it to Kennecott. They have taken out billions of dollars of gold. Mm -hmm. And you think, well, those stupid eggers. Well, no, they knew there was gold there. But they didn't have the money. How much money does it take to operate a, a gold, you know, gold mine, an operation? It takes billions to make billions. And uh, so they were never able to exploit that. And there never would have been billions of dollars of turquoise extracted from there. So these, these copper companies, they, the big companies, they didn't care about turquoise, and if anything, they wanted to hinder the mining of turquoise. And we talk about that especially in, in Bisbee. Because I don't think I finished that story, did I? Uh, Bob? Bob and Mark? No, because we all got, well, Cindy Smith got me. It's Cindy's fault. She got me all distracted about that. So, Mar knew the turquoise business, and Bob was the wheeler dealer guy. So this guy was painting his house or some house and he was doing development or something or other. And he started to tell him about this turquoise down at the lavender pit at Bisbee. So Mar, she's a go-getter and she contacts the superintendent and they go down there, they get the concession. So through the 70s, they had the turquoise concession. Well, they'd bring it back up here and work with Cecil and would be selling it. And you remember it that time, because I know I bought a bunch of turquoise and Jackson's still kicking himself for selling it to me that he had bought from Bob Matthews. So there was a lot of turquoise activity here. And then um, John Hartman tells a story about how he was involved in getting that, because evidently when Bob died, Cecil ended up with a lot of the turquoise. And then when he died, his granddaughter, Cecil's granddaughter, ended up with a lot. She wanted money for college, so. You know, you hear these stories and stories of turquoise, and you always got to take them with a little grain of salt. But boy, are they fun. <laughs> they are fun. Yes, ma'am. I was told by a friend of Bob Matthews that 
that um, Bob Matthews had the only right to use the phrase Bisbee Blue. As I understand, he did trademark that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they had a little shop down there on the rim, for any of you who are familiar with uh, Bisbee, as, you, as you're driving through town, you come through town, you go through the tunnel, and you come through town, you go past the, the main part of town, and there's the, the Queen Mine, which is the old uh, mine, which is a wonderful tour. If you ever get there, do take the mine tour. And then you go on around, and there's this big, huge hole in the ground, which is the lavender pit. Well, right on the edge there, they had a little shop. But you'll find as you're driving on towards Warren, at the end of the pit there, the, the road drops down. And that was because Bob had these two workers, and I don't know, Pancho and Beto or Pancho and Cisco or, or something or other. I can't remember exactly their names. So they're digging, 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 digging. We're getting that turquoise, digging, digging, digging. And they're going under the road. And the road starts sinking. And, and that's when, OK, you guys are out of the pit. And they sent them over to the dumps, number seven dump. And that's where they had to work after that. Who can go and buy the town of Warren, tear it down, and start digging for turquoise, I think you'd find some. But the price will have to get a lot more than $80 a carrot. <laughs> Did that answer your Yes. yes probably <laughs> way more. <laughs> Any other? Yes, sir. Driven through this wide spot in the road many times going to Denver. I was surprised when I read a story about turquoise that there was turquoise mines in Villa Grove. There were. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we have. Tell, tell me about Yeah, that's all in, in part two. We all, we all talk about that. There is a, a long history of that, and it's primarily in the 30s. A.J. Hall was the first one who really got that going. But he was 63 years old when he found his way. A.J. Hall was actually tied here. He worked for some resort. Do you, do you know that story, Jackson? He worked for Mason Birdie. Did he? Yeah. OK. So uh, something to tie. I think they were tied in with the, the railroad and some sort of resort or something. Anyway, he, he had a Durango uh, connection. And uh, he is jack of all trades. He did all this. Well, at 63, he found his calling in life, and he had a turquoise mine at Villa Grove. But by the time he got into his 70s, you know, it's hard work. And uh, he was either living in Farmington or at Aztec or Farmington. And he stopped and he picked up a young guy who was hitchhiking on his way to the oil fields. Right there, oil at round, all around there, I think, at that time, <coughs> after the war. And this guy was Menless Winfield. And he said, I need somebody to work the mine for me. So Menless went up there and worked the mine for a number of years and ended up buying it from A.J. Hall. So yeah, there was. But usually your problem mining turquoise is lack of water. Because to find the turquoise, you, you dig it out of the ground, and you, it's usually in muck. You, know, there's, you can't see it. So you need to wash it. And you get out in the desert, and water is a premium. And uh, so that's usually a problem. But up there in the mountains, water was a problem because there was underground springs. So right now, the old uh, Villa Grove uh, pit is underwater. And uh, it's um, Randy Christensen, the Christensen's from mm -hmm. Manassa. Mm -hmm. That's where Randy grew up. And he actually has that claim. Also in Colorado, there was turquoise at Leadville. In fact, the highest mines are there at Leadville. And there's, uh, they're really up high, and they look down on this lake. Beautiful area, but uh, <coughs> your mining window is pretty narrow <laughs> up, up there. But Villa Grove and King Manassa have been the two uh, primary mines, with King Manassa really producing by far the most over time. I never did answer your question about the most production in Nevada would have been the Fox mine, the Fox turquoise mine. And it is said, and I've run the numbers out, and I can say it could easily be true by my calculations, 
that that mine has produced more turquoise than all the other mines in Nevada combined. And that's because they found a lot of chalk. And so they were able to stabilize that. Most of the other mines in Nevada are highly, turquoise is highly silicated. It doesn't need treatment, but you don't find it that much. So it's much lower production. Yes? Uh, so early on you were talking about the importance of the railroads in moving uh, a lot of supplies and, and kind of getting the whole industry going with regards to turquoise jewelry. Was it the case before that point that a lot of, for example, the Navajo people did use turquoise as a form of, you know, just not, I'm going to say like savings, like that's like some of your personal wealth would be this turquoise you have, or did that not start until after? No, it was absolutely true. I would say for most of it, it was more of the silver because it was very difficult for the Navajo to obtain the turquoise. Oh. The Navajo have, have not been miners per se. Their, their history, their heritage came from, they were, they were herders. And they were, uh, as, as far as we know, because I always have this, <laughs> this trouble when I'm talking to the people, talking to Dina, and I say, yeah, you guys came here in you know, 1400s, and they look at me and they go, we came out of the ground. We've been here forever. What's your problem? You know? <laughs> I'm going, okay. Uh, you have to respect, respect that because I don't know. It could be true. Maybe they did come from the Athabascan people from Canada and down. I mean, that's what we're saying now. Probably came to this Four Corners area in 1400s, sometime around then. Not that much before the colonial period of, of uh, when Mexico came in. In any case, they didn't have a tradition of mining. Now, the ancestral Puebloan, where you have all their ruins around here, they did. And, and we, we know they were mining as early as 800, 900 AD. And in fact, they had established a, uh, a trading route east to west centered in Chaco Canyon, just down the road here. Mm -hmm. And at uh, Pueblo Bonito, they uncovered, I think, over 60,000 pieces of turquoise that they, that they found there. And at first, they thought, well, that's all coming from uh, Cerritos Hills, because that's the closest area there at Santa Fe. But, and we tell this story in part one, and this was really tough, because, I mean, I'm a, number one, I'm a lay historian. And, <clears throat> When you start messing with academia, you want the most cutthroat, vicious. You think business, other business is tough? You get into academia. My God, I've never seen more cutthroat people there. Because they're all protecting tenure and this and that and all that stuff. You know, it's nice to get a job where you, I could do nothing and you can't get rid of me. <laughs> so anyway, I was hesitant about getting involved in, in this area. And then we had to do this thing on the archaeology. And I was real nervous about that, but fortunately, Joan Mathian, who's a professor emeritus at UNM, she was really kind and very helpful, and she reviewed our text. And it was so sweet because afterwards, I gave her a copy of the book, and she said, you know, Mike, I wish you had published this book when we were doing our work. And I was like, ah, oh. it was just a, a wonderful feeling. But yeah, they were able to find by some sort of electron voodoo stuff, whatever, I don't know, that you not only can date the age, you know, we know about carbon dating and that, but there's a signature from particular mines show a different signature. So they were testing these mines from Chaco and they found uh, from Arizona, from Colorado, uh, from California, and from Nevada. So we know there was this trading network of these ancestral Puebloan miners. And if you think about it, it was really amazing because they didn't have dynamite, they didn't have bulldozers, they had fire. So you know, you'd see on the face and maybe they'd see a little blue. Build a fire up on that face. Then you had to get the water, get that really hot. Throw that water on there, crack it. Then you gotta go at it with the stone hammer. Now think about it. They weren't picking up that stone hammer from right next to where they were. Why? 
stone. Wrong kind of stone. You want to you want to break stone. You need a harder stone. So uh, Philip, my my partner, he really believes that anywhere in the early book, in the book, first book, anywhere that turquoise was found, they found tools of the prehistoric miners. So really, we are in such debt to the ancestral Pueblo and miners because they really created the first great American turquoise rush. And they were just amazing because then going at it with these stone tools, and Philip thought that the reason why uh, there were so many hammers left and stuff, he said because he thought these these tools were associated with the miner because they had had to find that rock, create that tool. And you know, a lot of people who work with tools, you know, your tools become a part of yourself. They get handed down from you know, father and son, mother to, to, to son, to daughter. And um, he says that he thinks people wouldn't use them because they were imbued with that power and energy of that particular miner. So yeah, we, we owe a great debt to those early Native American turquoise miners, ancestral Puebloan. The Navajo, which gets back to your original question, the only incidents we know of mining was at Leadville. They did some mining up in that area in 35 and 36, a couple of Navajos, but they were just there the one season. I think it probably got a little cold. <laughs> Dine boys, they, they were not used to that. I had another nice story here, and I'm not going to tell it. But it has to do with Dean Kirk, who's Mike Kirk's son from Manuelito. You know where Manuelito is? And uh, he was married to a Dine woman. She used to go up there every year to mine. And then all of a sudden she stopped. And you're going to have to find out why. <laughs> 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 if there's any Dine here, they may have an idea about why they stopped. But, uh, yeah, did that answer your question? Yeah, it did. I mean, I, I kept getting the impression in, in, not just from your presentation, but from various things I found out, I had always pictured in my mind that you would see them, you know, herding their sheep wearing giant pieces of turquoise, and this was just something they had That's always right, done I'm culturally. Sorry. And I think it was actually introduced much later than that, much closer to I was, the... Thank you. Thank you for getting like that. Because they didn't century. have that tradition, and I went off on this sideline. Thank you for bringing me back on track. You're sitting next to my wife. She's probably giving you some pointers. Oh, okay. <laughs> Get him back on track. You'll never... <laughs> so, yes, it was a storehouse of value because, you, you know, when these people came off of this... Um, long walk, this, this march when they went to Bosque Redondo in 1864, and then in 1868 they were given their homeland, right? Like, it wasn't their homeland anyway. But <clears throat> you now have the Four Corners, four sacred mountains, and they gave them, you know, a couple of sheep and this and that and the other, and it was amazing how the people did prosper from that. They had learned metalworking in the 1850s, and then in the 1860s is when they really started to develop their work in silversmithing that they did coming back in the 1870s. So they were, and at first it was implements, you know, great horse people. So the first thing they started to do, they make these wonderful, I don't know what you call them. What's the thing you put on the front? Head stall. Head stall? Bridles. Bridles, bridles, yeah. Bridles, and, and they love the... Conscious, right? And they put them on the saddles, and well, right there. You, do, you know, you get it on your saddle, and you do that. They're such great horse people. Then, um, and it wasn't, of course, men, women. They all wanted to, to wear this, but they didn't have a lot of of turquoise because at that time, remember, I was saying the turquoise was all controlled by these East Coast companies that were taking all this clear sky blue turquoise. They were leaving matrix turquoise on the ground couldn't use it. Um, so what would happen there at Cerritos, the Santo Domingo, the Kiwa people, who were really the closest there to those, and they consider that to be their, their minds, right? Because the, the, 
the one that was the closest to that and was probably in the prehistoric period has long since been assimilated into other tribes, probably Santa Domingo, Jimenez, other areas. They were related to the Pecos Pueblo. Um, and uh, so the Santa Domingo Indians would go in there and they basically high grade the turquoise and then they would provide that to other tribes. But it was very difficult to obtain turquoise and that's why you find in the early jewelry when you do find pieces of turquoise they're usually small and it's not what we would generally consider high grade. But no native person would really think that way. To them, the energy of the turquoise is in it no matter what. And, and, and of course, Arlen Ben, we have in here, I didn't, I didn't put the pictures as I was describing the mines because I thought, turquoise doesn't care when it came out, and so it doesn't really matter if it's, you're looking at Lone Mountain from the 20s or the 40s or the 80s. So we have these, Arlen Ben, who's a well-known jeweler, uh, Dine jeweler, and he did these magnificent photos. And I told Arlen, I said, you know, everybody can capture maybe the outer beauty of the turquoise, but can you show us a little bit of the inner essence? Of course, <laughs> I had Arlen hooked at that, right? Mm -hmm. His father was a medicine man, and he was raised traditional, and so he goes, I'm all in on this thing. Um, so, uh, yeah, they would, it was just hard for them to get. So yes, they wanted heavier, I mentioned earlier, they wanted heavier silver, because it was a storehouse of value. And it would fit in, since they didn't really work on a, on a money system, it would work in on the credit, because if you think of how they lived with their trading posts, is they were dependent upon the seasonal um, trade they would have. So they would have, you know, in the fall, they would, I think it was in the fall, they culled the herd, right, for the mutton. And then in the, in the spring, they'd shear. <coughs> Is that right, Jackson? Yeah, in the springtime. So they'd go in in the springtime and they'd have the sheep. Now, at first, they'd sold it by the, the, just the, the wool. And then they realized, boy, if we can do this, we can leverage ourselves up and uh, make a lot more money doing the weavings. But then they get to a point where between that and the, for the mutton, they would, they would sell the meat and that. They were dependent on the pinyons in, in, the, in the fall. But you know, around here, you don't know what your pinyon season's going to be like. You can go for years and not get a, get a crop. So they get to the gaps when they needed to get their cans of tomatoes and their flour and the rest of the things that they couldn't deal with, growing their little beans and corn and squash and whatnot. And that's where the, they, would, they would use the jewelry as credit in the pawn system. And really the pawn, everybody thinks, well, this was, you know, you, they pawn it like a pawn shop today. But my understanding is that's not the case because these Indian traders, they were just doing this to facilitate their ability to sell product and to finance their business. They were not interested in alienating their customers for when they came in to redeem their pawn and said, hey, you're 30 days late. I sold that baby. You're, you know, you're out of here. Well, they would say, we're going to the next trading post. We're not coming here. And you were really dependent on servicing those group of people within your diameter because, what well, was it, Jackson? Maybe it would be like a day's ride because people would do a day, they'd come in, they'd stay a couple of days, hang out, then they'd have a day back home. So you figure a, a day's ride in a wagon, so 15, 15 miles, something like that. So they had about a 30 mile radius that they were working in. And they wanted to protect that client base. So they'd do just about everything. They became the postmaster, you know, veterinarian, that's the you name it. They would, they would try to serve in that fashion. And, Mary Jane's dad, wasn't it? Your dad was involved in that business in the, as an Indian trader. So, and then Jackson in his dad's book, what's well, Night at Owl Mountain or what, what's it called? 
Halloween monument in Canyon. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> it's a great book, if you've never read that, because he tells all the stories. I love this one. It wasn't it at landings when World War II was declared? At Goulding's. At Goulding's. World War II was declared, and they had the radio on. And you said it was probably Denver, one of the big stations in class. KOA. KOA. And so uh, Bland, uh, Goulding was translating. So here are all the, the people from the area, 30 miles, they were all there. Of course, they didn't understand the radio. And he was telling them, your life will never be the same. Even just saying that, that book, I still I get, yeah, it's just really amazing. And that's a first-hand story from Senior, when he was, he's probably what, a young teenager? Right. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. Did I finally answer your question? Yes, thank you. <laughs> and about six others and nobody else. Cindy, did you have one? No? I was just going to say that my, my dad was in the turquoise business for a long time. Um, he had some turquoise claims in Leadville in the 60s and um, then in the 70s, 80s, 90s he had, um, he worked Pilot Mountain and uh, Crow Springs. Um, his brother mined um, and my dad did most of the now, stone cutting. Larry Cooley was operating it at Pilot. And then, did you know, did your dad work at all with, with Larry and at Crow Springs? And then when Larry died, he gave those to um, uh, Dennis and, and uh, Lucy, uh, I'm drawing a blank on their last name. Oh, um, anyway, I'll Cordoba. think of it in a minute. Cordoba. Cordoba, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. <clears throat> So they had those claims, and then they sold those because they bought Cousin Bill's King Manasseh. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And now my, my cousins, the Wilson brothers, are, are working Pilot Mountain. Oh. Yeah. So my dad is deceased, but yeah. her dad made my beautiful pendant. Yeah. Beautiful, yeah. <laughs> and your dad's name, what was your dad's name, Cindy? His name was Robert Smith, but he went by Gail. Um, okay. So he is... Uh, Bill's uh, uncle. Okay. Okay. So he would have been Bill's mother's brother. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, it's just a family affair here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, any other questions, comments, observations? Well, we do have uh, some signed books. For sale, if you'd like to, there are some representatives from Toa Ten here. We'll be happy to take care of you. Um, I'll be around uh, afterwards if anybody wants to, to have something off camera. Um, I would say off color, but no, nope, just off camera. <laughs> uh, and thanks for coming out. Thank you.